Hi, my name is Dr. Loretta Neal McGregor. I am a professor of psychology at Arkansas State University in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Thank you so much for joining me for today's AP Psychology Lecture on Developmental Psychology. So let's get started. What should you expect from this lecture? First, I am going to simply introduce the topic of developmental psychology, followed by a description of the topical perspective of development, and then the lifespan perspective. We will take a look at physical and cognitive development across the lifespan. And then finally, we will wrap this up by exploring why is this topic of importance, not just for me, but why should it be important to you? Developmental psychology explores how we grow and change across the lifespan. It is a part of a broader field called developmental science. Now, developmental science is an interdisciplinary field that seeks to understand the changes and the consistency of our lives through the use of the scientific method. It combines research from various disciplines, such as biology, psychology, and sociology, in an attempt to understand the behavioral and psychological aspects of human growth and development. When we focus on the topical perspective of psychology and, and in particular human development, in other words, basically we are exploring different domains of development and how it applies across the lifespan. In other words, we are looking at physical development that includes things like exploring the growth of our bodies and brains. And this includes looking at our systems and organs as well. We will focus on cognitive um, domain and explore the changes in how we think and reason and communicate over time, including the development of language. The emotional domain explores how our emotions develop and change throughout the course of our development. And the social domain explores how we understand ourselves and others, how we develop and maintain social relationships, and how we navigate the world around us as we grow. In exploring the lifespan perspective, it simply focuses on looking at different periods of development. We start with prenatal development and that explores how an individual or how an organism changes and grows from conception all the way through birth. We then make our way across the life cycle through distinct periods that are outlined here for you. We conclude by looking at late adulthood, and that includes issues related to aging as well as death and dying. Early developmental psychologists focused on looking at three primary issues, and they used these issues to help develop their theories. One of the main issues that earlier developmental psychologists focused on was the question of whether or not development occurs as a continuation or whether development is discontinuous. In other words, the changes that take place in terms of our development, either uh, cognitively or emotionally or physically, those changes, do they occur in sort of a smooth pattern or transition, kind of like going up a hill um, or just a slope? Or do those changes occur in a very distinct fashion, sort of like climbing stairs? Every step is different. And you know when you have moved to a higher level. 
So the question that early developmental psychologists focused on was, which is it? Is it continuous or is it discontinuous? Early developmental psychologists also wanted to know, is there one course of development that occurs for all individuals or are there many courses of development and each one of these courses are influenced by the individual. For example, when we talk about one course of development, the question is, do specific changes that occur across our lifespan happen to everyone in exactly the same way? In other words, do children who live in certain parts of Australia change and grow and develop the same way that children who live in parts of the US, as well as children who live in different parts of South America, do they all change and grow the same way? Or are those children's growth and development influenced by the fact that they live in different countries? Is it influenced by the language that they learn or about the experiences that they have related to the countries in which they live in? So when we talk about whether or not development um, has one course or whether it has many courses based on the individual, early developmental psychologists, they really argued about this. The next question that early developmental psychologists focused on was a question of nature versus nurture. And you may have heard this before. This debate still goes on today. In other words, one of the debates that a lot of people have is do our genes and our heredity um, influence our development and our growth or is it more of what happens after we get here? In other words, the environments in which we are nurtured, how we are treated, how the individuals around us act. And so those are the questions that early developmental psychologists wrestled with and used to focus in the cre on the creation of their theories. The answer to all three of them is yes. In other words, our current focus in terms of lifespan development focuses more on looking at a more cohesive explanation for our behaviors and for our growth and development. So we tend to focus on a more balanced view, starting with questions like uh, just focusing on, on assumptions and not necessarily questions, but assumptions that all development is a lifelong process. In other words, developmental psychologists have come to agree that development continues and we change and grow across time. Earlier theorists thought that development did not occur throughout our lifetime. For instance, they would say things like, our personality is set by the time we reach adolescence, or our brain stops growing by the time we reach a particular age. And what we found is that those types of statements are not necessarily true, that we continue to grow and change in many areas from conception all the way up until our last day on earth, until we die. Another thing that current lifespan development, uh, developmental psychologists focus on is that development is multidimensional and multidirectional. In other words, we experience both growth and decline throughout our life cycle. And we change in many different ways. All of these changes are, they don't necessarily occur simultaneously even within a particular age period. For example, you will have uneven changes that occur within a same individual. Uh, take, for example, a child who is learning math in school. 
And in particular, they are learning multiplication and division. The child may easily learn the multiplication table and they may struggle with division, even though they are inversely related to each other. Or another example is that a baby who is learning how to speak, they will learn how to understand language at a faster rate than they can produce it. So you can speak to children and you can have children understand the things that you say, but the children may not necessarily be able to respond to you in a particular way because they don't have the vocabulary skills to do so. So that's what we mean by multidimensional and multidirectional. Current lifespan psychologists also um, acknowledge that development is what we call plastic. In other words, we are capable of learning at any age. Now, they also acknowledge that there are declines in particular uh, behaviors that we engage in or abilities and skills, but we've also learned that we can develop compensatory skills to help us sort of mediate those declines or those changes. Um, lots of people think that as we grow older, our memory and our ability to solve problems decline. And most people think that those declines happen uh, fairly earlier than they do in reality. So one of the things that we found is that these declines can sort of be um, mediated or you can slow the progression of them by engaging in some activities to sort of sharpen or allow you to practice those cognitive skills and abilities. This is why you see a lot of games now advertised toward adults that will help them with memory and that will help them with problem solving so that the decline in these abilities are not rapid and that they can stave them off a little bit longer. Another example of um, plasticity is what we also call it, is that you can have individuals who may experience some sort of physical trauma and they learn how to compensate for that um, through training. I guess the best example I can give of that is maybe someone who has lost their language skills or their language abilities because of an accident. And the, that individual then goes through occupational and speech therapy and they learn how to regain some of that ability that they've lost. Part of that is because their brain has recircuited or rewired itself so that that individual can now perform those behaviors in a similar or exact way, even though the original area that was responsible for producing language or understanding language has now been damaged. It basically creates a new area to take over those abilities. So that's what we mean by plasticity or development is plastic. And then finally, our current perspective also focuses on the fact that our development is influenced by a lot of different interacting forces. So it's not just nature or nurture. It's nature and nurture and history and, and lots of other things. For example, when we talk about interacting forces, um, one of them is called age-graded influences. An age-graded influence is any event that is strongly related to age and the onset of most individuals. In other words, their, this particular, whatever it is, influence happens to most people around the same time. I guess a good example of that would be most children lose teeth around the same time, or most individuals will start puberty around the same time. Um, most individuals will, um, as, they, as they age, they will have different 
changes that occur physically around the same time. Now, there is room for individual differences in there. So people may not start exactly at a particular age, but give or take a few years, all of these things seem to happen to most people at the same time. History graded influences are events that occur during a specific time period in history and they greatly influence an entire generation of people. This generation is referred to as a cohort and whatever occurs and it affects the entire cohort tends to have lasting effects across the rest of their life. Examples of that would be when um, man landed on the moon. That changed the way people viewed science. It changed the way people sort of viewed the world and the earth and the solar system. And so those changes then changed not only that generation, but it changed how people were taught in school and education and all of those types of things. Our current pandemic will more than likely be considered a history graded influence because all of the things that are happening to individuals and in particular children who are developing at this point may end up have, having a lifelong lasting effect on those individuals. And then finally, non-normative events those events are irregular in their occurrence or they are considered irregular in their timing. An example of that would be a 14 year old who graduates high school and college at the age of 14. That's not an event that occurs for most people at that particular age. So it is considered a non-normative event for this individual. Another example would be if a child who is young, let's say five or six, unfortunately experienced the death of both of their parents. Most people do not experience the loss of their parents at such an early age. So this is another example of a non-normative event. Now that we've sort of had an introduction and we have talked about um, in, in a broad sense what developmental psychology is, let's look at two specific domains that I mentioned earlier. We're going to look at physical and cognitive development across the lifespan. Now the cognitive development that I am going to talk about draws heavily from the works of Dr. Jean Piaget. He is best known for his theory of cognitive development across the lifespan. In his theory, he posits that humans traverse through various stages of understanding and intellectual development as they grow. If you want to know more about Piaget's theory, you can actually find it online or you can follow the link that I have listed here. In addition, we are going to start talking about these two specific domains starting with prenatal development because I told you earlier that lifespan development really starts to focus on the growth and changes that take place even prenatally before we get here. So focusing on the growth and changes that occur all the way from prenatal development on. If you want to have um, a better understanding about prenatal development, there's a link that you can click. Um, you can pause this video, you can go watch the, uh, the video on prenatal development, and then you can come back. I'll be here waiting for you. So. Let's look at lifespan development from birth onward. So prenatal development is brought to a close through the process of birth. So now we've got the baby here. 
some things we need to cover first. Um, the birth experience, although it is something that happens pretty much the same way across the world, the average number of births that happen across the world and the average number of first births and the number of children differ dramatically. We're going to focus on births in the United States. So the number of births in the United States each day is about 385,000 babies are born. A lot of babies. On average, the U.S. family has about 1.93 children. And yeah, I know 1.93, how do you have 0.93 of a child? Well, we're talking about averages again. And so what we're really focusing on is that most families in the U.S. now have about two children. Uh, some families have more, some families have less, but when you average it out, it's around two children. This number has steadily declined over the past five to 10 years. Um, the number used to be closer to two and a half, but now it's down to, again, about two. The average baby born in the U.S. weighs about seven and a half pounds and is about 20 inches in length. Boys tend to weigh more than girls at birth, but firstborn babies, regardless of their gender, often weigh less than their later born siblings. This is primarily due to the fact that most parents, after they've given birth to their firstborn child, uh, they learn a little bit more about nutrition and taking care of themselves and what to expect. And so they tend to do things a little different with each subsequent birth. The other thing that we do know is that the weight of the baby is also often influenced by the weight of the birth parent. So let's say that we have our child and now we're in the first two years. Physical and cognitive development or all development within those first two years happens rapidly. It changes dramatically. I mean, think about it. From the first time you bring a baby home to about the time, uh, about the time that the baby celebrates its second birthday, they've learned to do so many different things. When you brought them home, they couldn't even move. They basically just sort of lay there and any of the changes that occurred, um, any behaviors that they engaged in, they were primarily based on their reflexes. So the baby is laying there in the crib and they're just sort of looking up and they're like, oh yeah, I really can't see because my distance vision isn't that great. And the only way they move their head is that if their head just accidentally flops one way. And even if their head flops one way, they can't move it back because they don't have the ability yet. So the child has to cry to get someone to come in and help reorient them. So lots of things happen within the first two years. One of the things that we do know is that even from prenatal development, um, their physical development happens in a, um, in a particular pattern. They tend to grow, babies tend to grow head down and then from the torso out. That has a particular name. Both patterns have a particular name. Head, excuse me, head down development is called cephalocaudal and inward out that is from the torso out to the extremities is called proximal distal. So when my students had a difficult time sort of remembering the difference uh, between the two, I actually created what I called the development cheer for them. And so I'd go, ready, okay, cephalocaudal proximal distal. And I would do the movement because cephalocaudal head down 
proximal, distal, inward, out. So this is happening within the first two years. And you notice this because um, it's interesting, the baby's heads tend to look much larger than their bodies. But this helps them. They learn how to roll over because the head goes first and the, and the body follows. As they grow older and they start to walk, Again, they're a little more top heavy because their heads are larger. So they lean forward quite often when they walk. And, and you can notice these types of things. Um, if you're around a toddler, look at them and you'll notice that their head seems to be, it looks a little bit larger than the rest of their body. They are also developing fine motor skills. That is, they are developing those um, motor skills that will allow them to manipulate fine objects, but they're also developing what's called gross motor skills. And these use the large muscles so that the baby is learning how to do things like crawl and like walk, those types of things. In terms of cognitive development, the senses are developing. Uh, the baby is also learning how to be more aware of their surroundings. And this goes along with some of the sensory development as well. Now they've created some depth perception. In other words, they can see things from a di are at a distance, which one of the things that they could not necessarily do within those first few months. And so now those types of changes are also coupled with their ability to learn how to crawl and walk and maneuver more within their space. Children also begin to understand that objects sort of exist outside of themselves. And they also realize that just because an object is no longer visible or in their presence, the particular object does not disappear. So if you've ever wondered why children are so fascinated by the game of peekaboo. This explains it. Prior to the development of object permanence, whenever an object is hidden from a child, it's almost like magic and it disappears. And then when the object is represented, again, magic, like it wasn't there and now it is. So you can play peekaboo with a baby all day long. And each and every time when your face comes back, it's like, oh my God, oh, she's back. I didn't even know where she was or he's back. Oh my gosh. Once they develop object permanence, the game of peek peekaboo no longer has the same uh, level of mystique as it used to. Children also within these first two years start to um, gain the ability to have intentional thought. In other words, they can sort of think about things that they want to do and, and do them intentionally or do them actively. They can store images in their heads and they learn how to problem solve. They're starting to learn how to do it. It's a very rudimentary skill, but this skill is necessary at this point so that they can build on it later on. Let's move to ages three to six. Here, physical development doesn't happen as rapidly as it did within those first two years. Um, it temporarily slows down, but you have lots of cognitive development still going on. The children, um, they don't gain weight as dramatically as they used to. But they, you will notice in children that they tend to have more bone growth. So they get taller and their limbs get longer relatively compared to their body. Basically, the uh, proximal distal is catching up, if you will, to the cephalocaudal. So prior to this period, uh, we're talking again around the ages of two or so. When a child would run forward, again, they would lean because their head kind of drives them in that direction. Now, um, their center of gravity is changing just a little bit because of the, grown, uh, the bone growth. And you will see that they become better coordinated. They don't lean forward when they run. They are now learning how to kick a ball, 
um, and their fine and their gross motor development also increases. In terms of cognitive development, their brain is still growing and about this age, uh, about this stage, it's going to reach about 70% of its adult weight. You also have more neurons connecting with each other, and you also have what's called uh, synaptic pruning. So those particular neural pathways that are not necessarily being utilized now, those are actually being pruned out or weeded out and they will no longer be active. Some of the research that looks at language development in children really demonstrate this. Um, and they show that certain phonemes or certain uh, sounds that children are able to make that are not related to native sounds in their language, those children can produce those early on. But as they grow and as they develop, uh, the belief is that synaptic pruning actually leads to them no longer having those abilities because they don't practice those phonemes and they don't practice those sounds anymore. Children also develop the capacity for um, mental representation, as I said before, and this allows them to engage in pretend play. So now they can imagine having a friend in their head and talking to them, whereas they could not necessarily do this before. They also start to understand and use symbols. So that's important in helping them understand math and learning how to write and, and those types of things. From the age, ages of six to 11, you have a return of rapid growth in terms of the physical development, but it's no longer that cephalocaudal proximal distal type of uh, physical growth that we saw earlier on. Now their growth tends to be more sporadic in different areas. So you will have the torso showing the most, most growth. Uh, you will still have a lot of bone growth and children will start to lose their baby teeth. They get stronger, uh, their muscles actually grow more and you will actually find that they tend to be a little more flexible because the ligaments that connect the bones, they are not necessarily growing at the same rate. And so they are not hardening as much as the bones around them. So it allows for more flexibility and movement of children this age. Early on, girls tend to be shorter than boys and they tend to weigh less. But by the end of this period, you see a dramatic reversal of that. And so around the middle school age, girls quite often are taller than a lot of the boys in the classes with them. But again, once we hit adolescence, this trend tends to reverse. Children also begin to understand particular concepts that help them grow cognitively. Some of those concepts that um, we focus on as developmental psychologists are listed here, conservation, classification, seriation. All of these um, show how multi-dimensional and multi-directional our development is. So conservation is where a child uh, starts to understand that the changes in the shape of an object does not necessarily alter the mass of it. So you can take Play-Doh and you can rearrange Play-Doh in lots of different ways. Um, and the child may think that it's more or less clado depending on how you model it. But once conservation takes place, the child begins to understand that you didn't add or subtract any Play-Doh, you simply shaped it into something different. So you can roll it into a ball or you can roll it into a snake and they understand that it's still the same amount of Play-Doh that you started with. Whereas a child prior to conservation, if you roll it into a snake form versus a ball form, may necessarily think that there's more in one versus the other, even though you haven't changed anything. In terms of classification, this is where children learn how to sort objects into groups. So 
children will start sorting blocks by color. They will sort their toys by particular size. So they're learning how to classify things. At this time, you also see them starting to classify individuals in terms of boys and girls. Uh, they may first start to have their awareness about differences in terms of ethnic groups because they're learning how to do classification. Theriation is where the children learn how to put things in order. So they learn that first is different than second, which is different than third. So all of these things are taking place and the children, they are, are learning how to grow and develop. They are developing and using what's called cognitive maps. In other words, they can come up with a representational map of an environment in their head and then they can use it. And then finally, children are also um, the, the, they are growing those neural networks and those neural networks are being strengthened by the growth of myelin that makes the, um, the neural network message go faster. And so this helps them learn um, how to reason and problem solve and they develop better thinking skills and abilities. Adolescence. In adolescence, um, this is when we have multiple physical and cognitive changes that are going on. But the key is this period is sort of a transition between childhood and adulthood. The individual start to develop more and they start to look more like an adult. The onset of poverty, uh, the onset of adolescent um, is puberty. And puberty is first evidenced by changes in weight, changes in height, um, and then you have these sporadic growth spurts. So within a few weeks of each other, the individual could have grown by inches. You also have an increased production of hormones, and this also influences weight and height growth in individuals, and it also starts the ability of people to develop reproductive ability. Girls typically reach their adult height around the age of 16, boys a little bit later around the age of 18, but it could go as high as 19 or 20 for boys. I have had students who over a summer break come back and they have grown almost five inches. Boys tend to have more growth in their shoulders. In other words, their shoulders tend to grow broader, whereas girls, they tend to have more growth in their hip area. In terms of cognitive development, the individual now has the ability to use reasoning and logic to examine all of the possible options and their consequences prior to acting on something. So this is typically referred to as a hypothetical deductive reasoning. Now the individual takes the opportunity to sort of weigh the pros and cons, if you will, about possible behaviors and their outcomes. Um, the individual also starts to develop and use metacognitive skills. Metacognition is where they are now capable of thinking about how they think. And this helps them with their hypothetical deductive reasoning. But as we talked about before, um, with multidimension and multidirectional growth, you also have some growth that's not necessarily positive in that sense. Um, a lot of young people during adolescence sort of feel like they are always being watched, that someone is always watching them and that they're always the center of attention. This is referred to as the imaginary audience. And why is this something that could necessarily lead to 
not so positive behaviors is because if the individual always feels like that they are being watched by someone else or they're under a magnifying glass, this has the potential to influence things like how they dress, how they act around other people, or even in terms of anticipation. Uh, they may anticipate certain behaviors uh, from other people that may not necessarily be realistic or may not come to fruition, but they believe they're going to. And this coupled with emotions and the growth of emotion can lead to a lot of up and down in terms of emotional turmoil and emotional states. Similar to that is the personal fable. That is the belief that nothing bad will happen to them personally, only to other people. And so this allows adolescents to take more risk. And sometimes those risks can be life altering in not a necessarily good way. And then finally, because the adolescent is dealing in hypothetical deductive reasoning, um, sometimes they get bogged down by all of the options. And that leads to them having difficulty and simply just making everyday decisions. Early adulthood. When we focus on early adulthood, we notice that young adults, they are still growing physically uh, and their cognitive skills such as reasoning increases. But you also have during early adulthood, the onset of biological ages are aging. So this is brought on by changes in cell division and reproduction. And you will see that people may actually start to have their hair change color. Uh, they may have sensory changes, like their vision may change or their hearing may change, all of those different types of things. In terms of cognitive development, uh, the individual starts to engage in more pragmatic thinking. In other words, they are using logic as a tool to solve real world problems. And they also learn to accept that life is simply filled with contradictions and it's a part of living. They don't necessarily believe that everything has this perfect answer. Um, individuals also start to have a more relativistic way of thinking as opposed to a dualistic way. Again, going back to what I said earlier, things are not always black and white. And as we grow older, we learn that there can be shades of gray in our thinking and in how the world works. You also have the development of expertise around this age. Some people become very adept at what they do. So you may have someone who they have really become a top chef. So now they're known as a master chef or they're really top in terms of being a mechanic and they are a master mechanic. They have simply developed expertise in this area that sort of sets them apart from everyone else. In middle adulthood, this offers the best example of multidimensional and multidirectional changes in terms of physical and cognitive development. Um, sensory changes occur and quite often they occur as a result of illness or disease. In other words, um, in terms of visual changes, you may have glaucoma develop or um, presbyopia where the person can no longer see things clearly up close, or there may be a reduction in hearing, so the person will have to start wearing a hearing aid. All of those types of changes tend to occur around middle adulthood. There are changes in muscle mass and strength, but as I said earlier, some of those things can actually be mediated. Exercise, weightlifting, all of those things can help you sort of change or, or slow uh, those types of changes that are going to occur in, in muscle mass and, and strength. You will have changes in terms of bone density. So quite often during the middle age, you will have individuals who they may start experiencing um, osteoporosis or, or early signs of osteoporosis. So when we are talking about middle adulthood, 
those are the types of changes that occur. You also have changes in reproductive ability for both men and women occur. This is called the climacteric. For women, um, this is most evident through menopause where they are no longer producing um, viable eggs for them to give birth or, or for fertilization. In men, you don't have them, um, you don't have it where they stop producing sperm, but their sperm count actually becomes lower. So those types of changes occur for most people during middle adulthood. Cognitive changes, you see changes in terms of crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence is our ability to use previously learned knowledge and skills. This actually tends to increase as we get older. Fluid intelligence, on the other hand, is our ability to learn new ways of problem solving and to perform activities quickly, that is mental activities, and you tend to see a decline just a little bit um, in, in adults at this particular age. But again, our metacognitive skills, they tend to increase and they can mediate some of those changes that may occur in terms of fluid intelligence. You also see some slight changes in reaction time, but there are things that you can do to slow those changes. In late adulthood, um, you have to remember, not everyone ages the same way. Um, physical and cognitive ages differ dramatically across individuals. And these differences quite often are due to things like um, the behaviors that the individual engages in. Did they smoke? Did they drink? Did they not smoke? Did they exercise? What are their eating habits like? All of those things can affect the aging process and how you experience changes in late adulthood. But some of the common things that you do see is that physical changes become clearly evident. Um, the hair changes color, you have losses in terms of skin elasticity. You also may have, again, changes in sensory ability. And these changes now can start to affect how you carry out your daily activities. In other words, it may not be as easy to do some task uh, now as you could when you were in middle adulthood or early adulthood or adolescence. You may have changes in terms of your organs. So cardiovascular and respiratory changes. Um, for example, the, the muscles of the heart are no longer as flexible. The same thing is true, uh, due to um, your lungs and lung capacity is not what it used to be. So those types of physical changes are the things that quite often take place in late adulthood. Cognitive changes, you may have um, normal age-related changes due to stale death in the brain. And this can lead to deterioration or changes in the smoothness of your motor skills and your motor abilities. And it could have an effect on um, mental abilities, reasoning, um, it could affect emotions, those types of things. One of the things that people also tend to believe incorrectly is that late adulthood is going to result in some sort of dementia. Dementia is where you will have a, ch a loss of memory or some form of memory ability. That's not necessarily true that it has to occur in everyone. It does occur more often during late adulthood. But sometimes there are other things that mimic dementia in individuals. Some people may experience um, depression or they may experience drug interactions. These things can mimic memory loss, which some individuals then may think is a general form of dementia. But once you take care of these things, once you no longer have the drug interaction or once you deal with the depression, the memory loss is gone. Finally, in talking about lifespan issues, we must also talk about death and dying. Uh, phenotology is the study of death and dying. And we consider 
death and dying as part of the lifespan cycle. If you want to take an opportunity to watch a video about end of life issues and how an individual sort of faces end of life issues, you can click the link and it will take you to a video and it's very brief. You can then come back and finish the rest of this lecture. So physically, the leading cause of death in um, most adults are often related to physical aspects. So heart disease, cancer, respiratory diseases. Those are the types of things that often result in death. Women in this country have a greater life expectancy than most men. The majority of Americans now, unlike some of the other countries, they tend to die in hospitals or in a long-term care facility. In the past, most individuals actually passed away at home. But with the advent of technology and the increases in our health care, most people now are in a facility when they come to the end of life. So, how was death pronounced? Death is pronounced when there is no longer brain activity and that brain activity also results in the um, organs no longer functioning. When someone passes away, when someone dies, every culture has a different way of dealing with it. They have a different way of how they reflect on the life of the individual, how they say goodbye, and how they mourn the person. All of these things are still part of the lifespan development process. And what we found in terms of death and dying is that it really does differ. It really is multidimensional and lots of things affect how we mourn. So, why is this important? I always tell my students that studying lifespan development is important because it's the closest thing you're ever going to get to a manual about how to live life. In lifespan development, you learn about babies and their development and how to be a new parent. You learn about relationships. You learn about how your body grows and changes as you grow older. You learn about what your aging parents are facing. And then you learn about what to expect in your later years and end of life. So that is why lifespan development should be important to you. I look at it like it's a user's manual. So here's your user's manual from me. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've enjoyed sharing this lecture with you. Thank you very much for listening and have a great evening.